So, welcome to the 2017 ninth annual ruckus. We're going to start today with uh, my good friend Douglas McLaren. He knows pearls more than just about anybody on the planet. So you guys are in for a real treat. He's always entertaining. And um, another quick announcement about what Douglas and I have been working on. I know you're all familiar with uh, Pearls is One. Douglas just finished the perfect Spanish translation of Pearls is One. <laughs> so um, it is going on the subdomain es.pearlsisone.com, which stands for Español. And uh, next week we will also have French on fr.girls1.org as well. Um, that'll be followed by Chinese. Um, it's going to be followed by Italian and Portuguese and German and Thai, possibly Arabic. So we're getting yaki. really excited. Um, it, not, probably not Yaki, unless you want to do that one as well. <laughs> so anyway, you're in for a real treat. Douglas, please take it away. Thank you. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome. And, uh, well, Today's uh, subject is the magic. <laughs> so let's talk about some magic. <laughs> I'll pull out a rabbit later. But anyway, so it's in Spanish. Sorry, I forgot to translate it. Okay, you've heard of the Cortez culture pearl, of course. You've heard of the natural uh, Cortez pearl, of course. But there are many other kinds of pearls in Mexico. Okay? So that's what this uh, is this all about. All those varieties of pearls that maybe you haven't heard of. Mexico has been blessed with two coastlines. Uh -huh. One on the Pacific, one on the Atlantic, just like the U.S. Uh -huh. But of course we have different environments. For instance, we have the Pacific, the Atlantic. And here we're going to see the difference. Okay, I think I put this. Yeah, so everyone <laughs> understands what kind of mullets do we get there. Okay, so we have Clams, we have the river mussels, Unionide, which we also have in Mexico, but we're not going to talk about those. We also have uh, the Teride, which that's where we have the, the pearl oysters themselves. Mm -hmm. And in Mexico, we have four varieties. We have the Gastropoda, all the snails and conchs, and the Cephalopoda. So these are the uh, octopus and squids and so forth. So those we're not going to talk about. Also, the abalone here. So, look. So, we have the Atlantic Ocean in Mexico. And basically, the most important body water, uh, water of body, well, whatever, uh, is the Gulf of Mexico. Lots of people think that Cortez pearls come from the Gulf of Mexico. Actually, many resources on books, really good books, uh, say the Gulf of Mexico. No. The Gulf of Mexico, unfortunately, is an environment that it's not suitable for pearl oysters. Okay, so where do we have the Gulf of Mexico? From Tamaulipas, just south of the Texas uh, border, down to Campeche, which is around here. And then we have the Caribbean Sea. That's a part of the Atlantic that most uh, tourists in Mexico know of. And it's a beautiful place. It's from Yucatan. Okay to Quintana Roo, right here, next to Belize. Uh -huh. So we even have uh, coral reefs over there. So the Gulf of Mexico is mainly sandy, muddy, silty, soft bottoms. Really good for clams, but not much else, okay? We also have lots of freshwater influence from rivers, like the Mississippi, the Rio Grande or Bravo, the Usumacinta, the Grijalba, which are south in Mexico. And all of these deposit lots of organic matter into the ocean. It's muddy, and we have large brackish water bodies. Uh -huh. So we have estuaries. None of the estuaries are really good or suitable for pearl production, unfortunately. We also have a large oil industry, both by the USA and Mexico. So we also have oil pollution. That doesn't make it very fun. Uh -huh. And then we have shrimp and other industrial fisheries in the area. So the Gulf of Mexico is a place that we would rarely think about obtaining pearls. But on the opposite side, we have the Caribbean. It has astounding biodiversity. If you've ever been in that area, it's, it's beautiful. And we have two varieties of pearl oysters there. We have uh, both Pintada and Teria. Teria colimbus, which can be found all the way from uh, North Carolina down to Brazil. So we have that little guy over there. And we also have Pintada Indicata, 
which is the same pearl oyster that the uh, Spaniards found when uh, Columbus came to America in uh, Venezuela. Right? All the little islands, of course. We also have, have conchs there, lots of conchs. And there's also scallops, pen shells, and spiny oysters, although most of those varieties are not that big, so they're not that important. Then we have the Pacific. In the Pacific, we can separate it into three areas. The outside of Baja California, which basically that fauna, all the animals that you find in that place, it's very much like the one we have, you have here in California in the United States, all the way up to Oregon. So basically the same thing. Then we have the Mexican Riviera. So from Mazatlan all the way down to Chiapas, we have Panamian fauna. So if you go to Panama, and it's very tropical, you see the same animals from Panama all the way to the Mexican Riviera. And then there's the weird part of the Pacific. Uh -huh. The Sea of Cortez, uh -huh. or Gulf of California. Why? Because it's right smack in the middle. And what does this mean? It's a subtropical ocean. Uh -huh. So it's not tropical, it's not temperate, it's in between. And we have both species. The ones from South and the ones from California. So, lots of biodiversity. So on the Baja California, the Pacific side, we have the cold California currents all the way coming down from Alaska, separate water. So what can we find there? Abalone, mussels, turban snails, scallops, and other varieties of animals. The Mexican Riviera, very oceanic waters. Sometimes they're cold, even if they're in a tropical area, but we have the big Pacific Ocean flowing in. Uh, so we have high biodiversity. And we also have pearl oysters, snails, scallops, and spiny oysters. Then the Gulf of California again. High biodiversity, lots of biomass, subtropical, so it's like Japan in many ways. But that's why sometimes people believe that our pearls, when they're the lighter variety ones, they say, hey, these are probably Japanese, especially the blue ones. Why? Because they kind of look like a koi. So we have pearl oysters, pen shells, spiny oysters, conch, snails, scallops. I mean, the diversity is amazing. So what is the main difference between natural and cultured pearls? Can you answer that? <laughs> What's inside? Josh, we're doing a talk. <laughs> main difference. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's like with people. It's what matters is what's inside. <laughs> well, the first thing is the origin. Is it provoked or unprovoked? Meaning us, humans, doing something to the oyster. So if we have unprovoked, they're natural. So here's Enrique over there. And he's seeding a black lip pearl oyster that we have in Guaymas. And here, this is a natural pearl we found in a farm-raised oyster. So we just opened up this oyster to seed it. And this is what we find sometimes it's whoa on a pearl <laughs> natural pearl it happens every year mm -hmm. so variety is everything and in the case of natural pearls natural pearls are have more much more variety than cultured pearls i mean think about it here we have culture pearls we have what a koya the first culture pearl ever then we have blacks the hebe Kamoka, Fiji, and ours, Cortez. South Seas, you have the white ones and the golden ones. Freshwater, there's a very large variety now. Non beaded, the beaded, Kasumis, Edison, Souffle, etc. And then we also have a very rare one that I don't think it's being uh, produced anymore the conch pearls from Florida. Remember those? Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen one in years, so it's probably that experiment has. It's terminated. And of course, there's also the abalone mummy. So basically, that's all the variety of uh, cultured pearls we have. But now, naturals, we have a splendid variety. Look at this, we have pearl oysters, but we also have scallops, all of the varieties of scallops. Pen shells, lots of varieties of pen shells as well. We've got mussels, both the freshwater and the saltwater mussels. We've got uh, gastropods, I mean, all the snails and conchs you can think of. Clams, nautilus, I mean, the variety is huge. 
And then the thing with Carnegie. These are supposedly bags filled with freshwater pearls. And there's a lot of no. pearls. <laughs> Lots of them. But in the case of natural pearls, this is an oyster that I collected this uh, season. And uh, we were trying to harvest uh, the culture pearls. And look at this. All of those are little natural pearls that came embedded in the oyster's mantle. So those are natural. We didn't do a thing to it. It's not the rainbow one. Uh -huh. It's very unusual. It sometimes happens. Yeah, uh, I once counted over 300 natural pearls in a single oyster. But really tiny. And the thing is, with natural pearls or with pearls uh, themselves, at least in the saltwater varieties, pearls are like children or babies. When a woman has seven babies, they come a little bit smaller, uh, <laughs> like unfinished. Uh -huh. Many are very sickly, uh -huh. but when a woman gives birth to one child, it comes out just perfect the way it should be, unless it's six months or seven months old. So it's the same with pearls. At least our oysters, the saltwater oysters, devote their energy to producing one magnificent pearl instead of 400 not really good pearls or small pearls. The other thing is the source, uh -huh. the origin. Sustainability is very important. So when you think about culture pearls, you have the source. In the case of natural pearls, you also have the, the source because the, the fisherman usually comes up to you and says, I took this out of the water yesterday. It's the pearl that came out of it. And you know he's not lying. And then you also have people that drive and uh, come with a bus in Guaymas and say, hey, I found this pearl in Rocky Point. Uh -huh. And they want to sell it to you. We don't buy pearls, okay? We don't buy natural pearls, but we get all those people. And also, we get people that bring Mallorca pearls. <laughs> <laughs> and say, I fished this one out. No, 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 yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and also, oh, yes. Already grilled. <laughs> Fresh out of the oyster. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so anyway, the fisheries, uh, the source for the pearls originally was the pearl fisheries. And in the old days, the old pearl fisheries were all about pearls. People didn't want to eat the oyster. They wanted the shell, but mostly they wanted the pearls. So this was an important difference because today, Things have changed. Look, basically genocide. This is a Mexican fishing vessel, pearl fishing vessel. Look at all those trays. They're full of oysters. You got all these guys just shucking oysters, and taking out the pearls, and of course cleaning the shell because the shells were also used. And in front of each tree, guys, you have another guy with a gun, usually. Looks like a gun. Uh -huh. No hanky panky here, okay? Cool. So basically, we destroyed the pearl beds all over the world because we wanted pearls. And you would say natural pearls beds are bad because you destroy the environment. Okay? So culture pearls are much better, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> now, with sustainable farming, you actually help the environment. So this is good, isn't it? But we're not talking about natural pearls, I mean culture pearls. But sustainability is basically protecting the environment. So we protect the native pearl oyster populations. We protect the environment because we have a no fishing zone at the farm. So all the animals that live there get to live fruitful, long lives. We also have, if you have one species of animal, this species of animal adds up to the environment. So we have more species. Remember, it's a web of life. And so you can think of a pearl farm sort of like a Noah's Ark. So if you have many pearl farms and they're all sustainable pearl farms, it's like having protected areas. So that's good. <laughs> Everyone likes these emojis. My daughter said, you got to get some emojis there, Dad. No one will take you seriously if you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, the new pearl fisheries... These are what we call in Mexico concheros, shell mounts. 
And this shell mound is rainbow lip. This one is pismo. And you can go on top of a mound, stand there, turn around, 360, and you see shells and trash, basically, as far as your eye can see. And you can find these all over Baja California, all over Sonora, all over Sinaloa. Okay? So this is not good. But this is the interesting part. Oh, this is a is another species. This is a, a pink conch. It makes beautiful pearls. I'll show you a couple, couple of pictures. And that's the same. Look at the mounds. I mean, you need one of those huge wide-angle cameras to, to capture all of this. So you would say, okay, natural pearls are evil. Uh -huh. They're bad. But look, this is the actual killer. Let's see if I can play this. It ain't working. Okay. Okay, the killer. The new rule says seafood. They're not being harvested for pearls. Actually, they don't really care for the pearls. What they're being harvested for is the meat. Mexico, back in the 1970s, people would eat like less than one kilo of seafood per year. Now, fruits got gone, gone up really high, like 30 kilos. So, Mexicans are eating a lot of seafood. And then we have tourists. Remember, we're the ninth largest uh, concentrator of tourism in the world. So every tourist that comes says, I want shrimp, I want this, I want that. I want conch. The conchs are amazing. I don't need them anymore. But, but anyway, and this is what's killing off the oysters. But this, luckily for people that love natural pearls, it's giving us natural pearls. Lots of natural pearls. And you don't have to blame yourself. Why? Because they're not going after the pearls. They're going after the cocktails and the tacos. Mm -hmm. So feel good if you buy a natural. Mm -hmm. So this is this is one beautiful natural pearl um, necklace that sold for five million dollars. I think you remember it a couple of years ago. This pearl necklace was fished off. From Sonora, the pearl bed measured uh, like 20 kilometers in length. So when the Spaniards arrived, they said that they would find a pearl bed. And they couldn't see where it ended. And in, after many centuries, we had one. Again, they started fishing. And because of all those millions upon millions of pearl oysters they fished out, this strand was possible. But they were, again going after the meat. So if you buy this, this is a byproduct. Let me show you a natural pearl that I brought from Pidia Sterna that was brought by a fisherman just a couple of days ago. It's a beautiful specimen. Uh -huh. It's from Pidia Sterna, a rainbow lip. So we have two varieties of pearl oysters, the rainbow and the black lip pearl oysters. Look at this one. This is another natural pearl that was handed down by a fisherman, a Yaqui Indian fisherman from Puerto Libertad. And he came with that huge pearl. The pearl was had a little bit of imperfections on the skin. And we called a, a person that we know, a pearl buyer, and he said, oh, I'll buy it from, uh, for, from you, not from us, from the fisherman. And he did. He paid the, the fisherman really handsomely. And then, just like three months later, he calls back and says, you know what? We're going to give the fishermen more money. Yeah, now, in Baja and in the Sea of Cortez, we also have this variety of uh, scallop. I would have wished to bring all the shells so you could see them. But you know what happens when you're crossing the border with shells? It's, I probably would be detained. So I'm not doing that. Not ever again. Yeah, exactly. So the lion's full of scallop. They're very interesting. They usually come like in three varieties of colors, like white, purple, and orange. And what is really striking is their pattern, their yeah. flame. So when you inspect them under a microscope or with a loop, you get to see this very definite pattern. And some people say it looks like a special, like a brand name of a, a very famous car. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that yeah. because they're not paying me to say it. 
Then we have the spiny oysters, also found in the Pacific, in the Sea of Cortez, and also in the Caribbean. Forgot to mention that. And these are really special animals. These are of the same family of uh, scallops and pearl oysters. And uh, they also come in different varieties of colors, mainly white, orange, and again, purple. But the thing is that these animals were conserved by many Indian nations all over uh, Mexico and all the way down to Central America as to be like God sent. So those pearls and the shells were really appreciated. And the, even the Pueblo Indians here in the States, in, in uh, New Mexico, would have shells and beads made from these shells. These are the most weird pearls, natural pearls I've encountered because the shells are not that amazing. But the pearls I've seen, wow, when they come up really nice, look, they have this amazing pattern, the, a very different flame than what I've seen in any other variety of pearl. The colors are sometimes funky. Uh -huh. They look like caramel candy sometimes, uh -huh. like hard caramel. But when they have the flame, look, it looks like an eye, like it's looking at you. So it's really weird. Another, a couple of examples. Also, they may also develop this really weird skin. So it looks like a grapefruit skin. Uh -huh. So it helps you to ID them. Uh -huh. And of course, it adds shimmer. When they have this flame, it adds a very shimmering effect. Uh -huh. Doesn't this one look like one of those corn candies? Uh -huh. So it's, it's a, a, a unique species of uh, animal, and they're producing these really weird and interesting natural pearls. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron told me, you have to have one there, okay? <laughs> so then we have the pen shells, and they're found mainly on the Cortez, Sea of Cortez and the Mexican Riviera. We have three different species, and all these three different species they come from the genus Atrina and Pina. And they're, if you've ever seen a shell of those, it looks like mother of pearl inside. And it's not mother of pearl. Okay? It's prismatic calcite. Uh -huh. So it looks beautiful. And basically, we have three different colors. We have jet black, really black, you'll see them. Silver, really nice silver. And an emerald green. It actually looks more like, not emerald, more like jade. It's really amazing. So here are some examples. This is the silvery variety. This is the black variety and the jade variety. And now they also come out in very funky shapes. And these are not made of calcite, but protein. So they're brown and they're not really nice, but still sometimes it's like, like a golf key. Look at that. So they're interesting. Even those are interesting. They're weird. I like weird. And more, uh -huh. you can see different varieties of potential pearls there. We tried even growing pearls in them. Now, the only problem is that being calcite, calcite is columnar. So they make columns of this material, of calcium carbonate. And the thing is, it's easier for these pearls to crack and break. So you will... If you grab the pearl, I don't know if you can see it from here, but using a lead, put the pearl, even on your phone, you can do that. Put it, light up, and you can see the fissures and cracks. And then it's up to you to buy the pearl or not. Usually they don't break, crack apart. But if you don't like fissures and everything, don't try these. Look at that amazing black pen shell necklace. Beautiful. Like gold, diamonds. Then we have mussels mm -hmm. from the ocean. Uh -huh. So these are mainly found in Baja and Cortez. There are many different varieties of uh, mussels. There are very large beds of mussels. But guess what? They're not being fished out actively. That's the only species so far that I have never found a conchero or mounts or even large amounts of natural pearls. The pearls are mainly made out of calcite and aragonite. The main colors are gray, white, pink, and blue. Look at this beautiful blue. This is kind of lavender. 
And you know the reason why they, they're not being fished? They, mainly the color. People don't like the deep orange color in their food. I don't know why. Uh -huh. And the other thing is, if you fish them in summer, and that's when most of the fisheries take place, they lose their sugary flavor. Uh -huh. And instead, they're not good. And they're also tough to eat. So people just leave them alone. If they fish these out in winter, it would be a joy. Uh -huh. So that's the deal. That's why we haven't seen enough mussel pearls. Then we have clams. Lots of varieties of clams. For instance, we have the chocolatas, the chocolate clams, which are fished all over Mexico. And if you look in a restaurant, they always have them. They're now being cut into pieces with shrimp added. And a little bit of sauce and lemon and everything and you just eat them like this and the pearls are coming out and they're very interesting some of them have a flame pattern now another one is the blood cuckoo do you know why they're called blood cuckoo they got red blood so lots of people don't like these at all and other people just love them so i don't like them. But anyway, the pearls, these are becoming very abundant. They're coming out rather round, which is interesting, but they're mainly just white chalky, so they're not that interesting, at least not to me. And this is one that came out of a clam, and it's supposedly natural color. I wanted to do all sorts of tests, but I could only take pictures and make it to see if it, some of it died, came off and no. There's no dye. But look at that blue color. It's amazing. And it has a great fruit uh, texture on the outside. Okay, now we are going to gastropods, the snails, conchs, and abalone. So on the Atlantic, we have the queen conch, the harsh conch, and other varieties. Pacific and Cortez, we have strombus, which is another variety of conch, turban shells mainly. And in Baja, we have the abalone and turban. And then we also have them in two different varieties, the nacreous and non nacreous So the conch pearls are usually non nacreous or how would you call them, Renee? That's it. Okay. <laughs> so abalone, three species, the yellow, the blue, and the white abalone. The animals can be quite large. They have a nacre, but they have lots of uh, protein deposits on their inner skin. So those also translate into the pearl. Here I have one pearl, if you want to see it. You can see both the nature and the protein. And they're very unusually shaped. Many of them are hollow, so they're lighter. And they're plentiful. Why? Because there's an established fishery in Baja. I don't know if you ever saw the picture behind, but men standing on mounds of shell. And of course, the shells are being shipped off to China. So, here we have some really nice examples of abalone pearls. A lot of people know about the tooth-shaped abalone pearls. They're very plentiful. But there's also some round that are not attached to the shell. This one is rather really, really round. But the pearl that has cracks in it because of all the protein. This is a piece that my friend Carlos Cabral made a couple of years ago called Reef Arrecife. In 977, pure silver, that's a variety of silver that actually kills werewolves, not just gives them diarrhea. <laughs> so, if you ever wanted something real, that's a variety. Look how he used the shape of the pearl to turn it into something that looks like, almost like wings and like a reef, uh -huh, like a Gorgonian coral. And then we also have the turbo. I don't know if you can see the back, uh -huh, but this is a typical Mexican carne asada in Baja California. And if you're in Ensenada or Rosarito, you will see the beef and everything and turban. Big turban shells put right there on the fire as well. So they will cook there and then you just grab them, eat them up. It's part of the carne asada now in that part in Baja. So they're mainly used for the meat, but of course the shell is also used to make jewelry, handcrafts, and of course, the beautiful fake mobby pearls. So these are just cut from the shell uh -huh, and then filled with, that, with an epoxy. If you want them blue, use blue epoxy. If you want them pink, pink epoxy. 
black, black epoxy. Uh -huh. And then we, we have some people that even have the nerve to visit the farm and say, hey, this is one of your pearls. And then bro, go on. <laughs> it's not a pearl. It is. I have a certificate. I can't, just can't find it. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. But anyway, that's what's happening. And look, these are very unusual pearls. They actually have the shape of the snail. It's weird. I've seen like 20 of these pearls, and they all have, like, they grow in the same way the shell grows, like in a spiral. And if you use a lead light, you can see the spiral as well. So these are really funky pearls. Then we have the horse cock. I don't know if you ever heard of this one, Diploflosus gigantius. It's from the Gulf of Mexico. It's a very large snail, sometimes it is big. It makes very special pearls, almost like mellow mellow, let's say. They're non nacreous and they're colors. When you think about the the the, the pearls that come from uh, conchs, the color is not like with uh, pearls that are nacreous. It's not because light is being broken into different colors, but because of the carotenoids they have in them. So they actually have this protein. So look, this is a true Mexican pearl. How can I say that? Look, look again. Oh, no. <laughs> Absolute homage to their, to their country. <laughs> Never try eating one. Okay. But look, this and then Jeremy and Hisano saw this pearl a couple of years ago. This is the most beautiful and special Mexican punk pearl ever. Look at the size. Uh -huh. And GIA even gave it last year, July 29th, almost like today, 2016. The loose natural, well, I can't read it. But anyway, it's 29 by 27 by 24 millimeters, 150 carats, and it's it's flawless, it says there. Gem grade is the most magnificent natural from this variety of animal in the world ever. It's, it was an amazing find. Uh -huh. Amazing, absolutely. Is it yours? No, I wish. <laughs> I wish. I can get to rub it every so often. <laughs> so we also have the queen conch from the Caribbean. You know this one. It makes those beautiful pink colored pearls. Mm -hmm. That everyone called jelly beans. Mm -hmm. They're non nacreous The color is carotenoid. So, why is this important? Because you should never let these pearls sit under the sun. Because ultraviolet light, ultraviolet light, actually destroys carotenoids. So, they will start to lose their color. The colors will fade. So, definitely never have them sit in the sun. Okay? And the major fisheries in the area of Quintana Roo. And uh, Yucatan make this pearl not very uncommon. What is uncommon is to find really spectacular specimens, but the pearls themselves are not really uncommon. I lived in Cozumel for a couple of months. While I was walking the beach, I would get approached by fishermen that would say, hey, sir, you want one of these? And if they're best broken English, they could. And I'm like, see? Lord, how's this? Oh, your Spanish is good. I'm Mexican. <laughs> That was weird. <laughs> More jelly beans, and also you have different colors. Sometimes you get yellow and orange colored. And of course, the most interesting part of these pearls is their beautiful flame pattern. That's what you're looking at, jelly beans. You just don't want the, the pink or the color. You also want the pattern. That's what makes it really special. Now, this is the burro conch from the Sea of Cortez. And this one doesn't have the beautiful colors. Okay? Mainly you can get pearls that are white, yellow, and kind of creamy colored, but these are becoming more abundant as well. You can see there, and they also have a similar pattern in them. But look at this. I'm never eating one of these guys ever again. This is what, looking at into Kermit the Frog's face. <laughs> I, I, a year ago, after a hurricane, I was walking the beach, and every possible animal that lands on the beach, I put it back in. 
And as this was nailed, you can see the shell was partially broken. Look at that. That's its eye. And it was looking at me. I could almost hear it bleeding. It's like, please put me back in the water. Don't eat me. But I was a vegan then, so. And still, so when I need it, put it back in the ocean. But man, it's, if, if you get to see one of these, you can't eat them. How can you? Now, remember that big shell mound from the snails, the pink snails? They're called Exaplex erythrostomus. And I've had the chance to see a couple. And they're small pearls, usually the largest one I've seen, five millimeters, but the color is a beautiful pink red. Amazing. And of course, there are many, many more pearls just waiting to be discovered because when um, fishermen lay waste to a population, they find a new target. So eventually they will destroy everything and find the new target. We will get to see more natural pearls. So I'll keep you updated on those. Now, just an update on, on this year's uh, pearl harvest. We obtained a uh, Cortez culture pearl production of roughly 1,500 pearls about one and a half kilos. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a large production, but the pearls came up really nice. Mm -hmm. We had better shapes, rounder, less baroques mm -hmm. for this year. Also, we had smaller sizes, seven millimeters, because we started using very small beads, 1.8 boot. Mm -hmm. That's around five millimeters. And I was telling Josh uh, last night that uh, we were expecting well, mainly seven millimeter pearls, and we were harvesting those oysters, and we said, oh, this is wrong. We made, we made a mistake. They're coming out with nine millimeters in size. So from five to nine, there's a lot of maker there. Uh -huh. They have very thick coatings. Uh -huh. Some of them even grew to 10 millimeters. Now, keshi, we didn't have many keshi, unfortunately, but those we got had really nice colors, beautiful shapes, uh, luster, and now, but the good news was the Cortez Mave Pearl Harvest. This is the best Mave Pearl Harvest we've had in years. The Mave Promise? Yes. Lots of Rodger Promise. Absolutely. So, since in 1996, we had a production of 20,000 Mave. Uh -huh. And then we started going down because we wanted more round pearls. But this year, we we noticed that we sell a lot more Mave at our store. And we're selling more and more, and then there are moments that we don't have any Mavi. So we said we've got to produce a lot more. So this year we produced a little bit over 10,000. Uh, actually, we haven't counted all of them uh, precisely, but I believe it will be like 12,000. Uh -huh. And the colors, I brought just 10, the best 10 ones from this year, so you can get to see them and everything, touch them. Five. Five. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but of course, they will become available during the rest of the year because we're processing them. Well, anyway, thank you, everyone. Thank you. So, uh, you're always, uh, you're taking questions now? Uh, yep. Minute?